Dear participants, may I call the house to order? Uh, we are very glad to uh, have uh, three distinguished speakers in our midst, and we hope that we are going to discuss uh, lively. And I encourage you to join the discussions after the three gentlemen uh, present their cases. But at the outset, I wish to express my gratitude for being requested uh, to moderate our session this morning centered on the issue of ASEAN maritime security, a topic that has been hotly debated among scholars as well as uh, government uh, officials. The latest being uh, in Sangrila Dialogue, I, I have the honor to attend, uh, during which there are a series of bilateral as well as multilateral negotiations or discussions among participants behind closed doors. So we don't know what they were talking about, but apparently there has been no uh, emerging consensus uh, emerged from the meeting. Uh, indeed, this issue has been the, on the world's agenda for long, maybe decades, regardless of the existence of the United Nations Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, that crystal clearly determined the conducts of all state parties on the, uh, on the sea. Currently, we can confidently uh, say that security in and around the South China Sea, as well as East China Sea and Straits of Taiwan, is not, is not as good as we would all expect. Miscalculation by one or two concerned parties may dramatically alter the simmering tension to an open conflict, the consequences of which will be beyond our common uh, imagination. Sea and air incident in the region, especially in the South China Sea, as well as in the streets of uh, Taiwan, involving the US and Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis China, continues to uh, raise tensions in our region. And it is further exacerbated by the un inconsiderate actions taken by the North Korea by continuously testing the uh, missile uh, tests as well as the latest being uh, the failed attempt to launch a spy satellite. The US as well as South Korea have promised to take commensurate measures to redress the situation. It is also noted, is, I think, it has to be noted, as mentioned as well by uh, coordinating minister as well as our governor, that the ongoing war on the European theater uh, between Ukraine and Russia involving the US as well as NATO also has a maritime aspect in it. Russian naval blockade of Ukraine's Black Sea, notably uh, Port Odessa, uh, has disrupted the supply chain, the global supply chains, skyrocketing the price as the minister a coordinating minister mentioned, as well as the governor, skyrocketing the price of oil, food, as well as 
fertilizer. If we cannot help ensure that the conflicts in the European theater can be peacefully resolved, as well as if we cannot prevent the second conflict theater in our region, I could not believe, I could not imagine what would befall upon us if those two conflicts erupted at the same time. Dear participants, uh, against this backdrop, as well as in an attempt to address this situation as well as the issue, we are indeed honored to have three distinguished speakers amidst ourselves. I start with Ambassador Sukma, who is the senior fellow of CSIS, former ambassador of Indonesia to London. He has contributed a lot. He has produced not only books, but as well as security analysis. Probably all of them, if not a few of them, have been used by the Indonesian government as the guidance to navigate through issues that uh, it is being confronted. I think his credentials cannot be, uh, you know, uh, second guess. <laughs> I believe being a um, former ambassador as well as a uh, senior fellow at CSIS Indonesia. We are also uh, very equally uh, honored to have uh, Datuk Nijam. His academic as well as military credentials as well cannot be second guess. Uh, your, I think uh, the CV uh, uh, speaks for itself that uh, he is one among those to be considered as the uh, policy uh, contributors, uh, contributors to uh, Malaysian government. And we are also happy to have Captain uh, Nibat, uh, Deputy Director, I think, in the Strategic Studies of NAFI, uh, NAFI uh, Study Centers of Thai uh, NAVI. His credentials also uh, very impressive, and we look forward to hear, to listen to his insights. Uh, in order to uh, to uh, heed the call of the governor as well as the senior coordinating minister on how best ASEAN countries can contribute to uh, the world by stabilizing uh, uh, our region because our region is one among those economic growth engines of the world being united in ASEAN countries. I still, uh, before I give the floor to those speakers, I would uh, underline the point being stressed uh, by the coordinating minister as well as the governor that uh, we would like to see ASEAN to become a force of reconciliation, a force of uh, movement, in order to uh, pacify the world, especially in our region. So, uh, according to the uh, program that I received, uh, Dato, you will be the first speaker. <laughs> and uh, look forward to hear from you, and the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, Om Swastiastu. Salam kebajikan and a very good morning. The IC moderator is Excellency Professor Dr. Imran Koton. Your Excellencies, the organizers of this forum, Lem Hanas, luar biasa. My fellow panelists, His Excellency Dr. Rizal Sukma. Uh, Captain Don Tipnat from Royal Thai Navy, ladies and gentlemen, in this August occasion at Borobudur Hotel. 
Indeed, it is my honor and privilege to be invited to Lemhanas to be one of the presenters representing National New Zealand College, Malaysia, in this seventh Jakarta Geopolitical Forum ASEAN Future addressing this region, Geo Maritime Reef. And I express my humble gratitude. Thank you. The topic that has been given to me is rather challenging, which is ASEAN Maritime Security Challenges. The challenges is not just about the topic itself, but because it is wide and cross many spectrum, but also the time given to, to deliver, and also the challenges posed to ASEAN in facing and mitigating those complexity at hand. My point of view may be different, as I am not a diplomat, not a scholar, just a plain military who understood what is duty, honour and sacrifice, the view of a practitioner. In the next 20 minutes or so, I will make an attempt to present to you on the topic that I will begin with the short video clip. the foundation for political and security cooperation to ensure that the stability and security of the region provides a conducive environment to promote economic growth and prosperity within the ASEAN community. I will brief the scope of my presentation as follows. I will brief the, uh, the brief history and concept of ASEAN. As everyone in this hall are well aware and know about ASEAN even better than I do. Then I will touch on the ASEAN maritime security challenges that lingers on currently as well as discussing on challenges to ASEAN in mitigating these complex maritime security issues. Maritime security challenges is geopolitical issues transcending multi-boundaries. There are four main variables that will become the cause of crisis or conflict and even can escalate to war. The four main variables are food, water, energy and climate. And all of these have been proven through history. Those four variables are now can be seen exist here in maritime domain. And this is one of the reasons contribute to the complexity of the maritime security. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the United Nations report recently admitted there is no such formal definition on maritime security as it is recent agenda, a diverse and contested concept. As for now, the meaning of maritime security generally can be defined as agenda of a collective thinking the importance and security of the oceans relating to the traditional and non-traditional threats. It becomes more important when it involves other nation states. The United Nations further identify maritime security threat as the following. Piracy and armed robbery, terrorist act involving shipping, offshore installation and other maritime interests, illicit trafficking in arms, weapon of mass destruction, illicit trafficking in narcotic and psychotropic substances, smuggling and trafficking of persons by sea, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, intentional and unlawful damage to marine environment and territorial dispute. ASEAN Maritime Area is becoming the fulcrum of the great power competition, and ASEAN only left with one choice, that is to stand united as one entity. Its deep water have replaced the European heartland as the fault line of geopolitical tension. New term been mooted out, which suddenly we are facing with Indopac, and have to come to term with newly coined terminology 
in the strategic realm. Challenges will be viewed both from the traditional threat and non-traditional threats. Blue economic and blue security, as well as the challenges to ASEAN in negotiating and mitigating the complexity. The maritime security deemed as complex, diverse and contested as it eludes into the uncharted frontier of grey areas of overlapping territorial dispute, safety of navigation, maritime conservation, naval strategy, as well as different interpretation and vested interests. ASEAN has been part of us for the last 60, 56 years, the age that signifies maturity and be able to stand on our own. Interdependency among the member states is much crucial now than ever before in simple term solidarity. This is significant when the geopolitics of the region becoming the focal point as well as intersection of influence and encirclement. This is the region that understood the meaning of colonialism since centuries ago and detests the feeling of being owned by others. We understood freedom in true sense, but nevertheless, since the new world order, we have been presented with the new form of colonialism, which is economic. We have been threatened by the hunger to conquest from the rivalry of major power in our region, even encroaching into our own waters. We inherit from our colonial masters the uncertainties of certain boundaries that create territorial dispute among us and with other states, while the non-state actor taking advantage and threatening our own ceiling of communication among many others. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the founding members of ASEAN consist of Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore and Philippines. The main principle is non-interference, the ASEAN way. And today, ASEAN have grown into 10 strong members and soon will be 11th with Timor Leste as a new member state. ASEAN believe in binding together in friendship and cooperation. Under ASEAN, there are a handful of organizations and mechanisms set up to ensure that ASEAN will continue to promote peace and stability in the region. ARF and ADMM, just to name a few. ZOFAN, or Zone of Peace, Freedom and Neutrality, have been the main thrust since 1971 and will remain the key principle for ASEAN. ASEAN have organized series of conferences, dialogues, forums, talk, and many of them are focusing on the maritime security issues. But until now, ASEAN, either through ADMM or any mechanism, have yet to issue a formal definition on standing on the maritime security. Not less than 10 forums or dialogues, even conferences by different agencies in ASEAN that talk and discuss on maritime security. Thus, ASEAN should avoid duplication of decision and becoming rhetorical. Instead, to be more practical and robust in nature towards achieving the goals of what they are standing for all this while. Through research, this duplication is overlap of cooperation as the result of different in terms of prioritization, capability, and perspective that can lead to ineffective cooperation. The latest initiative is the ASEAN community that stand on three main pillars, which are political stability and security, economic and culture, and also on political itself. These have been embraced by the member state and will be the way forward for ASEAN. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, what are the maritime security challenges that pose a threat to ASEAN? How does ASEAN mitigate these challenges? The list of traditional threat and non-traditional threat are seen as on the screen. In 2020, study made by Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs 
together with the Center for Strategic and International Studies suggested that the development of a strategic environment in which various maritime security issues, both traditional and non-traditional threats, which is getting complicated, unresolved border issues, continue to be the foremost concern of regional countries. Thus, the question that pertinent now is the traditional threat remain imminent. To me, as military professional and a strategist, and advocate for peace, the answer is yes. We are witnessing around the globe, the states are equipping themselves with latest toys that can match or provide an answer to their threat perception and satisfy their national security in order to uphold their national interests. In this region, the effort of confidence building measures or CBM have been proven effectively. But thus far, what about the non-traditional threats? These threats are becoming alarming and more increasing and pose more complex in nature as it happening at regular basis. The complexity comes from enforcing the rules and regulations, bilateral agreement, monitoring and effective action plan. The list that was on the screen earlier is self-explanatory in describing and imagining the complexity in mitigating the, these issues. Both of the threats pertaining to maritime security, what ASEAN clearly needed are the effectiveness of regional cooperative security, effective dialogue with consensus in concerted effort or action plan, transparency and independence, inclusiveness, mutual assurance, and understanding the concept of comprehensive security. This is crucial as maritime security is the main agenda and will remain for the years to come. Not so long ago, one of the ministers in the region stated that national interests supersede all other interests. And to me, he is not wrong. As the national security is protecting national interests, thus ensuring the national survival. How is this notion viewed by ASEAN with what they stand for the ASEAN way if each of the member states put their national interests ahead? ASEAN Community Initiative will be spearheading the concept of mutual interest and benefit, hoping it will be able to serve its purpose. CBM has been the main agenda in ASEAN and will remain strong in years to come. But can being neutral ensure that we will emerge to have the upper hand? Is there any crisis, conflict, or war won by remaining neutral? Will ASEAN continue to hedge with other powers and even among the members? How will ASEAN react if that particular powers choose to have bilateral engagement with member states instead of collectively. Australia is championing the blue security, and China is pursuing what they call global security initiatives. And ASEAN should come to a consensus in responding to both initiatives, the global security initiative proposed by China in April 2022, underlying six main commitments, which are, as you can see on the screen, While the blue security emphasized on three pillars, which are order, law, and power, as well as its vision for Australia and Southeast Asia to develop a joint agenda for maritime security. Dr. Mati Natalagawa, Indonesia former foreign minister, once said, there is an arch of instability all around the region from a potential rivalry between China and India for access in the ocean to nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula and competition between US, China, Australia and New Zealand for influence among Pacific Island countries. What perhaps new is the extremely deep sense of distrust that is now fueling 
and driving division among countries. These further indicate the multi-spectrum complexity of the maritime security that transcend across ASEAN borders. The other challenges that face ASEAN is the probability of ASEAN to reach a collective and consensus decision when and if these maritime security issues sharpen or increase in coming years. The what-if scenario should be the best strategic assessment in anticipating the future path for ASEAN. Let us ask ourselves the following questions. Will the ASEAN way be able to stand the test of time? Will ASEAN be engaging a serious and direct dialogue with China and the United States? Will ASEAN opt it to join a pact or alliance with the Western allies? What if China choose to continue to engage separately with the ASEAN member state with different solutions for each member? What if they are incident or skirmishes in the hotspot between China and one of the member states? How will ASEAN react? What if the AUKUS and the Quad supersede ASEAN relevancy in this region by becoming more active players? Why NATO planning to open the office in Japan? And what interest of NATO to be in this region? What if the Western powers continue pressuring ASEAN to take side? Will ASEAN fall into the Tusudite trap? What will happen to ASEAN when the United States and China rivalry mounting and our maritime area flooded with naval fleets? This question that I pose, and many more in your head, have no direct answers to it. And as we can only assume on the strategic impact and assessment and anticipate the cost of action. This question is the clear indication of the complexity of maritime security and the challenges that ASEAN is facing. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, within the time allocated to me, I made an attempt discussing on ASEAN, maritime security challenges, even dwell on challenges to ASEAN in mitigating these maritime security challenges, as well as poses some point to ponder by us today in understanding the complexity and uniqueness that face ASEAN in moving forward. ASEAN need to be consistent in pursuing their agenda no matter which member state hold the chairmanship. Maritime security will remain vital focus point for years to come, may it be traditional or non-traditional threats. ASEAN may need to look into the availability of the hard law that can bind us together more effectively. We have to admit to reality, no matter how bitter it is, that we are in the environment that are volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity of VUCA. Thus, the way forward for ASEAN will be more cautious yet robust, resilient, and steadfast as one entity to overcome VUCA. ASEAN have to look into worst possible scenario and best possible scenario as we are living in the world of uncertainties and may be prepared with the question of what if. The answer may not be as what they prefer it to be, but it will open up the mechanism to venture into the new frontier. ASEAN member states must be strong enough to withstand pressure internally and external as well. ASEAN need to find their own secret ingredients to move forward as one, overcome differences and sensitivity. An outsider can only suggest so much as they did not have the 56 years that ASEAN building themselves to be one voice, one ASEAN community. Allow me again expressing my gratitude to Lemhanas for organizing such an amazing event and inviting me from National Resilient College Malaysia to participate. 
To the Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, thank you, Matur Nuan. General, thank you so much, and Matur Nuan as well, from our side. Um, but I don't want to reinterpret what you have presented to us, but I think you have touched upon all salient points uh, that we need to know about the intricacies of ASEAN's uh, maritime security challenges. But uh, if I may, I would like to underline one or two points. Number one, you are concerned about unilateral uh, approach being taken by China in addressing the situation. I think Indonesia is also with you in that regard. And number two, you are also concerned about the intrusion of foreign power. I don't want to mention names <laughs> in our waters. I think Indonesia also has similar concern. And of course, uh, you also mentioned that ASEAN is a force of amity and cooperation. Why is it so? Because we signed, we declared back in 1976, uh, the TAC, Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Indeed, ASEAN is a force of uh, cooperation, amity, and as well as, as our governor rightly mentioned, is a force of connectivity. We try to avoid any conflicts using what you refer to as ASEAN way. I thank you very much for your insights. And may I now call upon Captain Nippon to present his case, please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the ambassador and my fellow uh, panelists. Uh, Ten days ago, I was given a topic for ASEAN Maritime Security Challenges, and I was uh, invited here to share my thought with you. Uh, there were seven questions, or at least, uh, actually, there are five questions with two sub-questions. Uh, totally seven questions, and I will share uh, one by one. But let me start by giving you snapshots on what I have seen in uh, the sense of uh, ASEAN Maritime Security Challenge. Uh, slide, please. This is very similar to uh, maritime security practitioner and expertise. Slide, please. This is also uh, very uh, common for uh, security practitioner and expertise. Next, please. This is a, a big wave of big challenges or big uh, approaches toward our uh, region. There are in, uh, Bell and Road Initiative, Indo-Pacific, uh, Free and Open Indo-Pacific, and uh, Act East from India. Next, please. Um, ASEAN has its own architect, architect for uh, security. And in maritime domain, there are ANCM, ASEAN Naval Ship Meeting, that uh, occurred every year. Next slide, please. And this is uh, uh, ASEAN security structure uh, down to uh, sectoral uh, issues. They are both bilateral, trilateral, and multilateral to try to cope with the um, issues occurred in ASEAN and, and moving toward ASEAN. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. But I would, I would like to begin my first question. There are many approaches, many mechanisms, many ambitions behind this for us to engage and 
to digest it in the way that uh, focus on ASEAN interests. From my point of view, this uh, approach initiated by external powers it merely serve external interests. This is our challenge: is how can we, how can we decide and realign our structure or our structure of thought to to cope with them and to to cast this into the way that uh, provide interest to ASEAN member. Next slide, please. And I look back to the history and I conceptualize it into uh, domains in maritime sphere and in time sphere that uh, from uh, classic era to uh, colonization era and to nuclear age there are shifts in uh, component or there are shifts in uh, detail of uh, issues that uh, external power moving toward and uh, working with or need to need us to working with them. Focus on uh, geostrategy and geopolitics. Nowadays, it's moving toward the investment and cooperation. And the key uh, mechanism for external power to control this is FATF, or Financial Action Task Force. And you can, you can look back only one year ago when, when uh, Russia uh, and Ukraine uh, crashed together, and FATF, or Financial Action Task Force, get involved. And Western country uh, include the um, United States, uh, Australia, and New Zealand uh, sanction on on Russia through this FATF. Next, uh, from maritime domain, I highlight the uh, AC. It means that the sea control, sea control capability is essential, essential for us to to keep us strong and to control our our water. Next slide, please. I will move to my second question. My second question is, what role does ASEAN centrality represent in the region maritime security challenges? I understand that this question stems from the... Uh, Indonesia is now a chairman for ASEAN, and many pressure uh, put up on Indonesia, and the ASEAN centrality will play the key role. From my point of view, there are three focus areas in geomaritime security challenges, respectively. The first is safety at sea. The second is stability. And the third is prosperity. The ASEAN Charter states that ASEAN's main objective is to maintain ASEAN centrality and proactive role as the main driving force for its relations and cooperation with external partners in open, transparent, and inclusive regional architecture. The ASEAN Centrality was defined as a regional architecture based on a framework that supports and strengthens each other with ASEAN as main driving force. The ASEAN Centrality concept emphasizes that ASEAN must become the dominant regional platform to overcome common challenges and engage with external power. ASEAN leadership should timely respond to the current world situation while carefully engage regional situation, especially in the security aspect, with fully respect to ASEAN principle and value. ASEAN needs to engage the issues to encourage and enhance cooperation in the region and must continue to develop an effective effort and have a constructive role as a platform for stability in the region. ASEAN may optimize ASEAN's central, central role by making ASEAN part of the solution than part of the problem in the, in the region. ASEAN continue to make constructive dialogue to maintain ASEAN impartiality and 
c a p a c i t y in handling the confrontation between major country in the region, which I hope not. ASEAN need to reaffirm the concept of ASEAN centrality, so that it is not threatened by interests and confrontation of major country in the region and external power. The strengthening of ASEAN centrality is required condition, so that ASEAN continues to maintain its identity as guardian of safety and stability of its member country. To sum up, in geomaritime aspect, ASEAN centrality should emphasize on a self-centered system for development, in order to be more reliant, more resilient, and able to maintain ASEAN impartiality. Then to the next question, how can ASEAN strengthen its role and contribute to tackle the challenges? Given that good law and order at sea is foundation for beneficial and profitable activities, also known as prosperity, as shown on the screen, ASEAN may prioritize safety, stability, and prosperity in their respective policy-making process. On the other hand, ASEAN may promote common law enforcement views and effort. To ensure better safety and stability in respective national waters, having had effective safety and stability, the prosperity for ASEAN member and partners is logical indicator for existence of optimum freedom in respective national waters. At the present, there are existing ground for constructive engagement in ASEAN and. Nearby regions, three existing mechanisms are responsible for information sharing and interoperability, for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and for maritime security. Embarking on this mechanism, ASEAN and ASEAN member can utilize existing mechanism towards safety and stability purposes. Why prosperity is corresponding, or will eventually correspond to the former factors? What is Thailand interest in relation with political security of geo maritime in the region? Thailand is presents co-chair for expert working working group for maritime security under ADMM, and is preparing for C. Chairmanship for the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and the Conclave of Chiefs from 2023-2025. The Senate's Symposium and Conclave of Chiefs is concluded. Sorry, is scheduled for the 19 to 22nd December this year in Bangkok. Main efforts for two chairmanships are to introduce. And promote common understanding, to conceptualize, and to bring to practice blue economic concept, in which stem from the UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030, Goal number 14, Life Below Waters. On the other hand, for emergent issues, Thailand seeks possible path and practice to maintain calmness. And serenity in its waters, in order to uphold the Gulf of Thailand, the water of friendship, and I hope for the water of uh, for water of Southeast Asia is the water of friendship as well. To this end, Thailand learns to redirect. Sorry, sorry, Thailand learns to de-radicalize an issues, and it is far better than to rise. Or to radicalize any issues, many issues need to be handled with care and require material support for SBS goals. What are common interests of the ASEAN country in relation with political security of geo maritime in the region? Based on what I mentioned, safety and stability 
are priority for maritime interest in ASEAN, respective national waters. This is primary interest. Collaboration and cooperation toward these interests are very welcome. In addition, there are upcoming difficulties stem from ongoing change and uncertainties such as climate change and warming oceans. Therefore, material support to each other to cope or to mitigate emergence difficulties are secondary interests. ASEAN need to enhance its capacity to accommodate and streamline subsequent activities regarding these interests. What role do ASEAN Maritime Forum and other maritime security play in the maritime security order. The AMF, I mean ASEAN Maritime Forum and Allied Mechanism may provide platform to jointly develop a building block for common awareness toward external power, to address regional value and interest, and to seek constructive engagement among ASEAN members. For futuristic point of view, since uh, VUCA, I mean uh, versatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguities, is new normal. The AMF may also focus on unknown security issues. To this end, AMF may introduce some topics for further discussion on the implication from either gray zone operation or foreign internal defense activities to realize interests of external powers that will have impact upon us. The discussion will help us to develop recommendations for ASEAN members to be aware or, prepare, or be prepared to mitigate undesired consequences. What sort of security architecture and Geo maritime scenario does ASEAN propose. Uh, at, the, at this time, at this moment, there are ANCM, there are GOTI, I mean Gulf of Thailand Initiative, and I am not sure that the, it had been enlarged to the Southeast ASEAN uh, Legal Law Enforcement Initiative or CMLI. Uh, I am not sure that it had been mature enough. As mentioned in the topic one, there, there are overwhelming concepts, arrangements, and mechanisms mostly initiated by external power. They merely serve external power interests than ASEAN common interests. In order to pursue ASEAN common interests, ASEAN members must focus their respective effort on own capacity building while seek cooperative support from external power. ASEAN may foster geomaritime capacity building in cooperation with external powers effort with careful focus on ASEAN geomaritime common interests. An idea on ASEAN capability augmented by partner expertise or ACAP may provide starting point for further discussion to develop security architecture and Geo maritime scenario to encompass as many as possible multiple approaches from external power as addressed in topic one. There are, but there are bold implications to ASEAN members to take both responsibility and interest. Ex Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude my thought. First, we are overwhelmed by external approach. Second, we are tested to emphasize on self-centered system for development in order to be more reliant and more resilient to maintain ASEAN impartiality. Third, we are to realize and prioritize safety and stability at sea while prosperity prosperity is 
corresponding or will eventually correspond to them. This is to highlight that safety and stability are primary common interests of ASEAN. Fourth, AMF and alike mechanism may provide platform to develop a building block for common awareness to address common value and interest in order to seek constructive engagement. And for future discussion, AMF may introduce future topic on implication from gray zone operation or foreign internal defense in which interests of external power are realized. Fifth, an idea on AKEP may provide starting point for future discussion. Last but not the least, I would like to welcome uh, you to IONS 2023 in Bangkok uh, this December. Thank you very much. Captain, thank you very much for your excellent presentations as well as for the timely fashion in which you delivered your presentation. I think you have touched also an array of uh, salient points related to ASEAN maritime security. And one point that I would like to underline is that I'm quite familiar with the terminology that you mentioned, that is ASEAN centrality being a uh, former senior official meeting uh, leader of Indonesia to ASEAN as well as dialogue partners for six consecutive years. So I'm quite familiar with, <laughs> with the terminology. But one thing for sure, it is up to us to make sure that indeed ASEAN should become a central, uh, a central power in the dynamics of our uh, uh, region. Uh, and then uh, certainly I would like to invite uh, Ambassador Sukma to present his case. The floor is yours. Very good morning to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Bapak Gubernur Lemhanas, Pak Andi Ujayanto, Bapak Wakil Gubernur, and Ibu Deputi, Ibu Reni, my fellow panelists, and Ambassador Imran Kotan as the chair of the session. I can assure you that I will try to finish it before 20 minutes up, because I will not talk about all those issues that usually you are familiar with the theme of the maritime uh, security issues, such as a trans uh, crime at sea and the questions of like uh, sea lanes, you know, security and so on. I will leave that to Jane Chan, she's the expert you know, on those on those issues. But I will try to answer a very simple question. Can ASEAN survive the 21st century great power competition? And this is, I think, you know, relates to the questions that Ambassador Imran Kotan just raised about ASEAN centrality. So I will also uh, mention uh, the uh, centrality later on. Uh, but in following the tradition of many Singaporean academic and officials, I will stick to three points only. You know, so you have to have three points, right, in Singapore. Uh, since too many uh, Rajaranam schools uh, connection here, so I will follow that, that formula. So first, I will talk about the context, then second, about the challenges, and third, about the recommendation. Okay, the context of the geopolitical, especially in the maritime domain, I will try to highlight six trends that we have to look really, really carefully and we have to watch uh, uh, very, very carefully for the next years to come. Uh, there are six trends which will shape the future of the sea in the regions. First, the changing nature and value of the sea, you know, with the corresponding consequences for great power relation. Traditionally, the strategic value of the seas in Indo-Pacific is self-evident. So the sea is important for trade, for international cooperation to ensure safety and security of the sea lane as a source of livelihood and so on. In other words, the economic significance of Indo-Pacific seas is difficult to overstate. The sea, for many of us, is a global and regional public goods. However, there have been concerns that strategic transformation in the region 
you know, I don't need to dwell you know, into this uh, very specifically, but you know, the rise of China, the rise of India, the changing power relationship among great powers, they're all you know, part of that transformation. This transformation would diminish the value of the regional seas as regional public goods and transform it into a domain for major powers competition, defined more by the pursuit of national strategic interests, which might not always align with collective regional interests. So the growing need you know, to fuel economic developments at home would drive the countries in the region to increase their ability to secure greater access to energy sources at sea. This would complicate further the nature of major power relations in the regions, particularly at sea. So the relationship among major powers would increasingly become naval. This means that their relationship at sea will be increasingly defined by military competition. And consequently, the chances of risk of accidents and miscalculation would also increase. This process would easily slide into confrontation and conflict at sea among major powers. So therefore, in the years to come, we will see the changing nature of the sea from economic values which emphasize the nature of the sea as a public goods, hence allowing the positive sum cooperation, into strategic values which emphasize primacy and control over the sea, which of course, you know, uh, push us to think in terms of zero-sum uh, uh, formula. So that means the returns of traditional security dimension of the sea as a major preoccupation of states. And second trend, the future of the sea will also be defined by the relationship between the US and China. So we need to watch very closely where this most, most important bilateral ties is heading. The ongoing signs at the moment are not very encouraging. Both sides seem to find itself in a position that will intensify rather than reduce the competition. So this trend would open up the possibility of the ongoing competition becoming strategic rivalry, where positive sum relationship become more and more difficult. So that, that rivalry, which we begin to feel and see, is becoming a reality now. And regional countries have already been under extreme pressure to find the best ways to navigate Sino-US rivalry. The third trend, we will continue to see the Indo-Pacific becoming more and more crowded as the center of geopolitical and geoeconomic gravity of the world is clearly shifting to Indo-Pacific. It is to be accept, expected that other powers from outside the regions would also want to seek a place you know, and space of engagement in the region. So we see several European powers already come up with their own version of the Indo-Pacific strategy and, and engagement. So this presents you know, both opportunity for broader cooperations for ASEAN and at the same time also you know, the challenges you know, in order to manage, uh, for ASEAN to manage its external relations. The fourth trend, as the value of the sea is changing from economic to strategic, attempts to find solution to maritime disputes would become more and more difficult. And fifth, as the traditional security concerns of the sea increase, state would focus more on maintaining maritime advantage. So we have begun to see this in the region. While countries may offer different reasons and motives in explaining their novel programs, the impact is all the same. It will alter and change balance of power. And when balance of power is affected, perceived or actual, rivalry among major powers will soon gain its own momentum. So competing states will intensify their strategic presence at sea, among others through naval presence, coalition building, alliance strengthening, and also military build-up. The sixth trend, we will see an increasing marginalization of maritime-based non-traditional security challenges in academic and policy discourse. I can give you an example. If we organize a conference you know, on piracy, on uh, climate change, and so on, only three or four people would come. But if you organize conferences such as this, more than 200. Especially if you organize conference on China-US rivalry, probably 300, 400 will turn up. 
So it really marginalized, you know, the uh, place of non-traditional security issues in the public uh, discourse. So what are the challenges that ASEAN face? Uh, there are uh, three that I would like to highlight. First, ASEAN face a serious challenge of maintaining unity among its members. So ASEAN unity is really under pressure uh, because of the heightened competition between the US and China. And if this competition becomes a strategic rivalry, it might polarize ASEAN. ASEAN will be divided into four groups of states. Pro-US, pro-China, non-aligned, and confused state. So you can bet that you know, there would be some countries who are confused you know, within ASEAN in, in facing the great power rivalry. So that's, you know, I think, the first you know, serious challenge that uh, we, we, we're facing. Know, how to maintain unity. And this you know, ability to maintain unity has been also eroded by the fact that we still cannot agree on how to deal with intra-ASEAN problems, especially such as in the questions of Myanmar and, and at the moment. The second challenge, if unity cannot be maintained, ASEAN's role as a manager of regional order will diminish, and ASEAN centrality will be under challenge. So this challenge, among others, have been manifested in the formation of minilateralism in the regions. So I think the formation of the Quad, the AUKUS, and all other minilateralism reflects the competitive nature of regional order in Indo-Pacific. And also, I think, reflect the growing uncertainty with regard to the confidence of extra-regional powers in ASEAN ability to manage the growing challenges that we are facing and at the moment, the new geopolitical and geoeconomic challenges require real substance and outcomes, not only forms and open-ended process such as that we are seeing and experiencing within ASEAN over the last probably 60 years. And the third challenge, based on the first and the second challenge, the third challenge is the imperative of maintaining ASEAN strategic autonomy. I know that Pak Gubernur already mentioned this and not very happy with the term, but this is a reality because it is becoming clear that Southeast Asia and the ocean, the Pacific and also the Indian Ocean will become the central mandala for great power competition. So it is here in Southeast Asia and also in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, the strategic referee will play out. And I think it is ultim ASEAN ultimate strategic interest and by implication, Indonesia's to ensure that ASEAN remains autonomous and the competition will not undermine regional stability. ASEAN should make it very clear that we don't like both Pax Americana and Pax Sinica. In fact, it is not in the interest of anyone if the region dominated by one hegemonic power. ASEAN and also great and major powers will be better off with a multipolarity where all countries contribute to regional stability and prosperity. If ASEAN cannot address the need to safeguard unity, maintain centrality, and strengthen strategic autonomy, then ASEAN will become irrelevant. As an organization, you don't need to dissolve ASEAN. ASEAN will continue to exist. But we will remember ASEAN only when we hold a ceremony to commemorate its founding on the 8th of August every year. And then I don't think that we want you know, to come to that uh, possibility uh, in the years ahead. The final point, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me a few minutes, I would like to address four recommendations that ASEAN you know, need really to take. The first one, ASEAN need to examine how the emerging maritime rivalry would impact on the future of UNCLOS. We should not take UNCLOS for granted. It is likely that there would be attempts to reinterpret and redefine UNCLOS by great powers in accordance with their own strategic interests. This, in turn, could undermine international maritime order and threaten regional countries' interests. ASEAN should continue to place UNCLOS at the center of a rule-based maritime order in the Indo-Pacific. Second, ASEAN needs to get creative to find new ideas, breakthrough in managing South China Sea. 
especially you know, in pushing through the code of conduct. Trust is eroding very quickly among the climate state. Too many incidents and recent developments have not been very encouraging. Doubts and skepticism about the COC are growing. Nationalism is also on the rise in number of climate states. So calming the South China Sea will remove one potential flash point and reduce tension, tension among great powers. So unfortunately, the COC is the only framework that we have now. We like it or not, so we need to continue to find ways on how that we can really push for its conclusion. But in the meantime, I would propose that we need an interim agreement you know, on how to prevent accident and incident you know, through a set of rules on you know, how uh, uh, vessels you know, should conduct itself you know, in, in the area. Third, ASEAN should reflect on ASEAN weaknesses, you know, especially in the institution, and then try to strengthen them whenever possible. ASEAN does have a convening power, and it should use it to reinvigorate the importance of multilateralism in the region. So the East Asia Summit does provide the best promise for multilateral security cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Surviving the great powers competition would require ASEAN to strengthen its capacity and institutional effectiveness. So let's hope, of course, you know, the next summit in September you know, will be up to the challenge uh, and then try and then, you know, hope that they will come up with fresh ideas on how that we really refine the regional architecture through the strengthening of the East Asia Summit. And the final recommendation that we would like to put forward, once the East Asia Summit becomes a premier forum for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, ASEAN needs to suggest or to propose an East Asia Summit pledge on comprehensive regional security as a new pledge, as a new framework to shape security and prosperity in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Sukma, for your excellent uh, insights. Uh, I don't want again to reward your uh, presentations, but I think uh, I'm very glad uh, to have you among ourselves. I have known you for decades. This is the way you present your views, very robust, open, and sometimes you use lemon language. <laughs> Probably, uh, you know, uh, cannot be taken by, easily by others. But anyway, uh, the point, I think the, we need to underline the, points, uh, the point that you mentioned, that ASEAN should not be an intended victim of Sino-America rivalry in our region as to prevent us from exploiting our own resources. I think you are absolutely right in that regard. And then as well, you mentioned how we would be able, how can we best preserve ASEAN as a force to, to be reckoned with. And I'm sure the governor is here. Uh, he would, uh, after this meeting, he would send a very strong note to the president how best can Indonesia move ASEAN into that direction. I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure about this. And I hope that our discussion this morning will uh, present us with uh, brilliant ideas. And uh, after listening carefully, to the three distinguished speakers, uh, I think uh, they have presented us with uh, a lot of uh, salient points uh, that uh, probably may provoke you to raise questions, as we all expect, as well as if you have contribution to enrich our discussion this morning, you are most welcome. The floor is yours, but before that, I would like to remind you to identify you and the organization re you represent before taking up the floor. And the floor is now open for participants. I don't expect that the governor will also pose questions. Thank you. Anyone from this side? Oh. Please. 
thank you so much indeed for this opportunity. And thanks a lot for the presentation. Those presentations really, really enrich and also strengthen, even amplify our perspective and ideas. I am Major General Budi Pramono from uh, Lemhanas. Allow me to raise two questions. The first one, given to the polarity of ASEAN, if I may divide it into four big parts, those countries who take part to the America, those countries who take part excited to the China, those countries who steady like the rock as non-block, and those countries really, really firm in the corridor of confusion, in the corridor of bewilderment. Excellency, uh, Mr. Kotan uh, said that how ASEAN survive. In this case, I really want to know in number how many percent those countries who take side in U.S. take side to China as non-block and even in the corridor of confusion. This is very important to us how to calculate how strong, how solid ASEAN in the future in terms of uh, facing the next and dynamic threat in the future. That the first one. Uh, the second one, also given from the seven ASEAN outlook. Of course, the first one, we should uphold our international law. This is very important. Why? Because we are living in the international kitchen. We are living in the borderless countries in this planet. Of course, we should uphold our international, especially the principle of the international. And then, the cooperation. We couldn't avoid the cooperation. Every conflict happened, we should solve by cooperation or even collaboration. We don't have other system or strategy except the cooperation. After the cooperation, of course, in this case, no matter how high the escalation in this uh, regional, but we should avoid it. That's very important. And other thing that needed is please consult to the other country. Perhaps the other country... You may proceed with your question, General. Yes. That's seven ASEAN outlook. My question is, do you know actually who is or what is or how those superpowers reply? Unsure and then take action for our seven ASEAN outlook. This is very important, because we should know exactly to whom we deal to. If we do not know that how ASEAN deal to whom, so for what? How we can cal calculate in this matter? This is very important. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Uh, I would presume that your question is directed to uh, the three speakers but uh, they are free to respond to your question. Please, for those uh, speakers. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, General Budi. Uh, on the first question, so I think, in principle, every country, including especially members of ASEAN, you know, really want you know, to stay non-aligned. They don't like to be pulled you know, into one camp or the other. So that's for sure. But my worry is that, you know, when the pressure comes, then, you know, countries would calculate, right, according to their, you know, strategic interest. Then, probably, you know, when there would be the temptation to choose. So we, at the moment, it's very hard to say that country A and B already in the Chinese pocket, country C and D already in the American pocket, and country E and F confused, or, you know, uh, country F and G is actually non-aligned. So that is actually, uh, I think, uh, the state of play at, at the moment. So each member of ASEAN still value 
the so-called strategic autonomy of ASEAN as a whole. So that's why I'm torn with regard to the utility of ASEAN. On the one hand, it cannot solve and manage and respond to this kind of problem. What the under, on the other hand, this collectivity within ASEAN actually provide you know, the uh, possibility for member states to actually deal with the pressure from, from the outside. So we're still struggling you know, within that, that context. So when you see, for example, well, only two countries in uh, ASEAN treaty allies of the U.S., Philippines and Thailand. Even for Philippines and Thailand, I'm quite sure uh, there are you know, Philippines delegate and Thai you know, uh, uh, speakers here you know, would, of course, you know, value the autonomy. They don't want to be basically told what to do, and then they would define their own interests by themselves. That, I think, probably preferable for you know, even uh, allies of the, the great powers. On the second one, I'm not sure I understand the seven outlook, but what, the only outlook that I understand is basically the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, outlook. Well, all the major powers, all the great powers, you know, already pay uh, support or say support, or probably you can say lip service, but nevertheless, they basically all support the Indo-Pacific outlook you know, that you know, ASEAN come up with, uh, because they do understand the so-called quote-unquote neutrality of ASEAN works in the best of interest of every great powers. So I don't think you know, even China and the US you know, will benefit if ASEAN you know, uh, get divided. So at the end, United ASEAN serve you know, the strategic interest of great powers. So because they do need you know, this region not to be dominated by any hegemonic power. So that's basically my take on where we are at, at the moment. Thank you, Ambassador. I think uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, united we stand, divided we crumble. General, will you please? Uh, Major General, thank you very much for the question. It's very interesting. When you talk about polarity of ASEAN, in my very short speech of that 20 minutes, I touch the very worries that we have. What will be ASEAN in the future? We have been given uh, definitions of Indo-Pacific, but not by choice. They've been uh, feeding towards us. All the while, we know what is Asia Pacific and what is Pacific Ocean. And suddenly the whole world accepting the Indo-Pacific. Why are we accepting Indo-Pacific? Because of certain rules and regulations. If ASEAN succumb to the polarity of the four definitions that you mentioned who are on US side, who is on China side, who is solid rock and non-alignment, and who, who is in state of confusion, that will be the time where ASEAN will no longer relevant. You have to consider what is the role of AUKUS coming in? What is the role of Quad? ASEAN left with no choice, but we have to stand united. We have to avoid polarity with all costs. Sun Tzu have said once, know your enemy, you win half of the battle. Know yourself, you win the other half. So by knowing which side we are choosing, which side we're supposed to be strengthened, I think ASEAN can last longer and remain relevant. Because we have, no lo we have not left with any choice. We understood colonization more than any other continents in this world. Hundreds over years, we've been, been dominated by other powers. This is the time ASEAN have to get rid of the sensitivity, but instead sit together, be more transparent, be more inclusive, understand where is the direction of ASEAN. It is difficult, but I'm sure we can work it out using ASEAN way. Now we are promoting ASEAN community. On your second question, whether um, which side, uh, seven outlook, which are we direction to, either China or US, if you look into a lot of initiatives that have been introduced lately, Indopac, Quad, um, now recently the Australia proposing the blue security. This is the answer to what ASEAN stand. Whenever we launch on something or we, we announce on something, the other regional power will come up with their own initiatives to either coax or to ask ASEAN to work together with them. You can look into GSI, proposed by China, Indo-Pacific Stand, proposed by United States, 
and global secu uh, blue security proposed by Australia. So whatever that we are doing or what we are announcing as our stand, there will be a response immediately after that. Uh, this is, I think, ASEAN will remain relevant because whatever we said and we decide, they listen. Because we, as one, have to remain strong. We are 10 nations into one organization. Yes, we need the hard law. We are not equivalent to EU, but we move it, moving towards that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Datuk. I think I am 100% with you by saying that ASEAN should continue to be a united front. Captain, do you have anything to say? Please. Yes, I, I, I would talk about something on tech side or not tech side. Um, we need to look back to the term interconnected uh, and uh, interdependence. And actually in the uh, security uh, sphere, there are <coughs> multi-dimension in military, in politics, in economic, and uh, uh, so society. Uh, look back in, in Thailand. We have the neighboring country that with different uh, regime and different uh, tendency toward the superpower. We need to manage to, to, toward the equilibrium. We have, uh, Thailand has the economic link with uh, China as big as economic link with uh, Europe and the U.S. So it, at this moment, it's not a time to say take side or not take side. It is a time to manage it at best. Thailand has to manage both Thailand's own interests and had to manage uh, external powers' interests and had to manage the neighboring country interests for, for the base of our people. Also, Thailand respect to the uh, ASEAN principle. And I think this year, uh, Indonesia takes chairmanship for uh, ASEAN, and Indonesia can, can embrace the, the difference or, or the different tendency among uh, member states in mainland and uh, island, <laughs> mainland and, and uh, in, in maritime area, to, to reach some uh, points of common acceptance that uh, we can go together. I think the, our uh, governor said this morning that we are not the perfect, we are not perfect country, we are not perfect region, but we are moving toward a better region. We are moving toward the uh, more safety and more stability region. The primary indicator for this is uh, prosperity. If uh, the chance for prosperity is remain uh, plus or remain uh, positive, it means that we manage well enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also completely agree with you that ASEAN, uh, geographically, ASEAN countries are the force of interconnectivity because we are sandwiched by two oceans and two continents. That is why ASEAN countries, I think, have been able to moderate views coming from those four corners. So we have to continue to be a force of interconnectivity, otherwise we lost our DNA, naturally. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, probably we still have two or three questioners. Yes, please identify yourself as well as organization you represent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Loro Orta. I'm from, uh, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Loro Orta. I'm from uh, uh, Good morning. My name is Loro Orta. I'm from uh, Timor Leste. I work for the Council of Ministers. Uh, will you speak up a bit louder, please? 
My name is uh, Loro Orta. I'm from uh, Timor-Leste. I work for the Council of Ministers. Uh, it has become very fashionable now uh, to say that uh, ASEAN is losing its relevance because somehow is uh, becoming a victim or unable uh, to prevent uh, great power rivalry or dividing itself into blocks. Uh, I don't have a question, just a comment, uh, a, ref a small reflection. If we go by this criteria, then almost uh, every organization is irrelevant because if you look at organizations in, in, in Latin America, uh, you know, they have not been able to, to achieve that. Uh, same thing goes for Africa. In Europe, uh, during the Cold War, uh, France uh, went its own way. Ireland was neutral, so was Sweden. So I think uh, uh, we, we shouldn't be, uh, have too much expectations on ASEAN or be too hard on ASEAN. Uh, in my humble opinion, and uh, I think today ASEAN is far uh, more cohesive uh, institutionally and administratively to coordinate uh, uh, its positions uh, better. Of course, there will be uh, differences uh, in, in, in opinion, uh, and there will be uh, countries that um, will, will, will uh, be more uh, inclined towards one power or another for economic reasons, for uh, geographical reasons. Uh, but I think the, the, the criteria of uh, uh, whether uh, as, uh, the ability of ASEAN to somehow uh, m mitigate the, this um, uh, great power rivalry should not be uh, 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 you know, the, the, the central criteria, because in my humble opinion, if we go by this criteria, almost every single organization has failed. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, points of views. Uh, I also presume that you address your concerns to the three speakers before us. Uh, probably, General, you may start first. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, basically, I think you touched on relevancy of ASEAN. Uh, if you look into for the last 15, 6 years, ASEAN have been existed now. We also launched the new ASEAN initiative, which is the three pillars is political and security, economic and culture. As long as ASEAN negotiate or discuss with other powers as one, ASEAN will remain relevant. As long as ASEAN relies, we will not fall into the two-sided trap. ASEAN will remain relevant. As long as ASEAN, ASEAN can put aside the sensitive issue issues, ASEAN can stand relevant. The relevancy of ASEAN is very crucial, not today, not tomorrow, but years to come. Because more and more pact and alliance that you realize have suddenly exist around us in ASEAN. And ASEAN cannot afford to even negotiate or even have a talk isolately as one nation, but not without as one organization. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that ASEAN will be a always relevant force to, to be reckoned with, uh, especially when uh, Timor-Leste decided to... <laughs> join uh, this organization. Captain, do you have uh, anything to say? Yeah, I would like to share my thought on this. The, uh, the question is if ASEAN will lo lose its uh, relevancy in uh, global politics. I think no. Because ASEAN is now the 25 years, 35, 55 years old, or, or 56? No, 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 ASEAN. 56 years old. It is one of the, 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 the I mean, long life international organization or regional organization. I think ASEAN will survive and will find a way to, to present itself in uh, global politics uh, or global political arena. With the, the three pillars it established, it, it is strong enough, but uh, there, there will be some shortfall that the shortfall to recognize and embrace the uh, issues or, or, or problem of, of a specific uh, or particular member. Because what we can look is that uh, we can look the, at the ASEAN. Uh, in a big picture and, and within the three pillars. 
there are, there are opportunity or chance for single members nations to uh, build up relationship, relationship with external power. That is not prohibited if that uh, fulfill that 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 fulfill the uh, member state uh, national interest as long as it doesn't uh, pose the threat to ASEAN as a whole. Yeah, I think. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, I can give you long questions, a uh, long answer or, or short one. But of course, you know, since lunch is, will be in 15 minutes, so I'll give you the short one. ASEAN, of course, you know, serve a certain function. When we established ASEAN in 1967, the function was very clear, you know, to create or to stop all these hostilities among, you know, key founding members, especially Indonesia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and also Philippines and Malaysia. So it's basically, you know, to stop this uh, unnecessary conflict so that we all can focus on national development in each, you know, uh, in respective uh, uh, countries. So that was the purpose back in 1967. So it's a political and security objective, and then that objective was attained through economic cooperation. So that's why we heard a lot about you know, economic cooperation during the first 20 years of, of ASEAN, even though now it's still, uh, but by 2003 it changed, right? Now we brought in the uh, political and security uh, cooperation as well. So in creating this you know, sense of community, I think ASEAN was very relevant. And in fact, it's crucial to the fact that no ASEAN member state contemplate the use of force anymore in order to resolve differences among member states. So I don't think that anyone here, you know, from ASEAN countries still think war as the solution to whatever problem we might have, you know, in our bilateral relationship. That is the purpose of a community of nations called ASEAN. But if you look at, you know, what happened after the end of the Cold War, it's very clear. ASEAN is also drifting, like now it's drifting, but in 19, you know, I think 90, in early 1990s, also drifting. But at that time, I think pa Imran was still at the foreign ministry, ASEAN was brilliant when it came up with new initiative, new format on how to deal with a post-Cold War era so that it can maintain relevance. You know, if we didn't come up with those ideas, I will come back to what ideas they are in, in a moment, but that is, I think, is very clear, right? So ASEAN didn't know what to do anymore because no more, you know, these uh, challenges uh, that, that they were facing during the Cold War. It's suddenly a new era. But the ASEAN leaders at the time came up with the idea, look, we try to secure this region by keeping great powers outside. Hence, the Zofan, the TS, uh, Zofan ideas. Zofan is an attempt to keep extra regional powers outside. So, so is Asia will be you know, stable. But that changed in, I think, uh, 1999 or 2000, after the economic crisis, right? We came up with the new idea, with the APT, the ASEAN Plus 3, and then the East Asia Summit. So the paradigm changed. Basically, ASEAN will continue relevance. It, it can work with the extra regional powers. So we invite them in through the APT, the East Asia Summit, and so on. Then ASEAN, you know, maintain its relevance. So in that context, maintaining our relationship with the extra-regional powers, after the end of the Cold War and after the financial crisis, I think ASEAN played a very relevant role. Now, you know, with the new context, geopolitical context, once again, ASEAN is faced with a very serious challenge to its relevance. I'm not saying that ASEAN is not relevant, so then you know, let's you know, dissolve it. No, but you know, this actually, well, if you reach 56 years old, then if you don't change your lifestyle, you are you know, having this risk of heart attack. So ASEAN in that stage. So it is important for ASEAN to change as well. In Vietnam, during the summit, we came up with the ideas, yeah, we agree, then you know, we need to really strengthen the capacity and institutional effectiveness of ASEAN. There are a number of recommendations. So we need to work on that. 
So this is what I think ASEAN countries are working on. But again, this is not easy because it's something new that will, you know, I think uh, affect all of us. So we are still in the process. But I think, at least if you ask me, I already said you know, uh, before this, the only possible short I think, term solution to the challenge that we face, focus on the East Asia Summit. Use the convening power of ASEAN. You know, I think ASEAN still has that, you know, the ability to convene you know, some kind of dialogue and bring all the great powers, major powers, small powers, middle powers, confused powers to the same table and then try to discuss you know, the future of, of the region. So once again, I'm not saying that ASEAN irrelevance, let's get rid of it. <laughs> so, but you know, if we don't do anything, then ASEAN will get heart attack. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sukma, as usual, very sober and very clear uh, in putting forward his, uh, his thoughts. Um, I think uh, one point that uh, I, I wish to underline that uh, indeed geopolitical map keeps changing and now ASEAN is being confronted with at least new phenomenon like the race of AUKUS, you mentioned also, as well as Quad, what ASEAN would react to this new reality, as well as conflicts in Europe and probably somewhere nearby in our neighborhood. So ASEAN has to basically keep uh, itself uh, relevant to the challenges uh, in front of her. I completely agree with you. And before, I think we, before we uh, conclude our sessions, I still have another questioner from this side. Oh, uh, this is a, a good friend of mine. Please, Admiral Ivan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I am a real Admiral Ivan from Indonesia. Uh, such as we know, uh, Indonesia is not a climate state on the dispute area of the sovereignty of ASEAN countries over the South China Sea or SGAs. However, um, Indonesia is most likely threatened by the conflict in the regions. Not only that, um, Indonesia owns Natuna Island and the Malacca Strait, and most of the sea lands travel through archipelagos, especially SGS, um, which is major belligerent states will expose this area and make them collateral when conflict happen. Now, uh, the United States with AUKUS might balance the power in this SGS area, yet at the same time it opened potential major conflict in Asian region. In fact, according to ASEAN's commitment to restricting outsiders from interfering in Asian region, and such as we know also that uh, diplomatically speaking, Indonesia is a non bloc now, considering both rationals, uh, what is the best way to deal with maritime security in SGS, and especially for uh, ASEAN's member uh, who involved in that area? And what is your perspective on the role of Indonesia for maintaining maritime peace and security in SGS? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now we start from you again, and then to be followed by can you repeat Datuk, the second? Then, uh, the, second the second question, we didn't get it. The reaction for us to uh, to uh, to confront the challenges in our uh, maritime uh, uh, security. This, that's the second question. Oh well, uh, you know that's a very broad question. <laughs> I think some of the ideas have been laid out by Dato and also by the captain uh, uh, before. So we'll focus on the South China Sea. Uh, yes, you know, we're not a claimant. We do not claim, you know, any uh, part of the South China Sea. But, of course, there is this dispute, quote-unquote, you know, with regard to the EEZ, you know, especially when, you know, some uh, illegal fishings are taking place, 
uh, and also some surveys, you know, by a climate country, you know, also uh, 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 took place. What is the best way to deal with the South China Sea problem? Like I mentioned earlier, Admiral, there is no other option available but the South China Sea, uh, the Code of Conduct. So that's the only framework is available at, at the moment. So that's why I envision the Code of Conduct is comprised of three parts. The first part on the CBM, is basically you know, confidence building measures. And second part should be about the preventive diplomacy part. And then the third part, you know, basically crisis management mechanism on how to address crisis whenever it arises you know, with regard to the South China Sea conflict. I don't know what they are negotiating at the moment, so I think you know, it started even long before uh, Ambassador Imran Khotan became the, you know, the SOM leaders and then the second gen of the foreign ministry, what, 23 years now? Uh, no, 21 years from 2002, uh, they are negotiating the code of conduct. But you know, this is still the only one available. So I think, so that's why I propose before we can really complete the code of conduct, which I don't think that we can finish it by September this year, even though Jane just whispered to me before that you know, probably Indonesia would come up with great results you know, of all these problems that we face. I said, don't dream, Jane. So it's not going to happen you know, this year. It's going to be a long-term process. Uh, so that's why probably we should start thinking also in terms of interim solution to the problem. What is the biggest problem that we are facing in the South China Sea? Incidents. You know? So you don't want to have incidents or accidents. You know? So these are the two. You know? So we need to have an interim, say, not probably not code of conduct or rules, if you like. You know, for example, you know, you're not allowed to use like laser you know, against a ship that passing each other. You should not use water cannon you know, to spray on the other ship that passing the area and, and so on. So we should focus on those technical agreements before we can conclude the code of conduct, which I don't think that we can because of the three very difficult problems. Number one, I don't think that we can have an agreement on what is the status of that code of conduct. Legally binding or not? Only suggestion, recommendation, or hopes? We don't know. You know. So I don't think that we can have agreement. Some want to be legally binding. Some, they don't want to have the code of conduct legally binding. That's number one. Number two, I think we cannot agree on where this code of conduct should apply. The geographical scope of it. You know, because we can have a debate on where exactly is the South China Sea? You know, where it ends, where it starts, you know, I think that's up to debate. So that's the second problem that we face. The third problem, with regard to the code of conduct, can other countries outside ASEAN and China accede to it? You know, should they be part of the negotiation or should they be allowed you know, to accede to as a signatories later on? So I don't think that you know, it's easy to reach an agreement of that. Because some countries argue that, look, you know, we also have legitimate interest in the South China Sea because of the significance of that South China Sea. So we need to be part of the discussion. We need to be part of the dialogue. Even some say probably we should be part of this negotiation of the Code of Conduct. So you know, instead of like dragging and you know, uh, debating on these three issues, it's better to come up and try to focus on interim solution, which focus on technical aspect of preventing accidents and incidents in the South China Sea. Thank you, Ambassador. Being trained as a diplomat, I always see a glass half full. And in diplomatic circle, sitting, drinking coffee is already considered to be a progress. So. I hope that uh, sooner than later, we will be able to conclude negotiation on codes of conduct. <laughs> I've, I got fed up with this <laughs> terminology. Please, Captain. Yeah, I would like to share my thought on this. Even though it's a long question, long question but I have a maybe short answer. <laughs> um, for South China Sea, there are two, two approaches to take. The first is uh, multilateral, as we have code of conduct to, to talk on that and to follow or to fix it. 
Uh, the another approach is bilateral. It is dangerous because on the bilateral, we have uh, two sub-approaches. The first is negotiate. But it's hard to negotiate with the big guy. The second is to make a law, uh, make, to make a case to, to the court. Also, it is very dangerous to fight on the court with the big guy. So they are bilaterally and, and uh, multilaterally path to, to choose. Or you change your paradigm. Think about that uh, South China Sea problem is a deterioration. You cannot fix it and learn to live with it. It may take uh, more than generations to, to, to reach the optimized solution. My uh, foundation idea is that we fo focus on the, the three, three pi, I mean three pi in my circle chart. Uh, safety, look at safety, look at stability. If safety and stability is uh, at the accepted level, Let's say okay with it for a while, and focus on the prosperity. If prosperity remain plus or positive, I think we can live with it until we can find a way, a better way in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dato. Will you please? Admiral, thank you very much for the questions. Basically, your question is uh, looking into what is Indonesia as an claimant to South China Sea, and how do you react? I would like to quote what Ambassador Rizal has said about ASEAN. Uh, we are about at the stage to receive heart, to have heart attack. And the question is, should we go for bypass or stenting? Uh, this is the question that we should ask ourselves. And when you talk about South China Sea, there's no one easy solution. You must realize that um, one of the channels that open is ADMM. Defense diplomacy. Uh, not just because I'm from the military professional, but I still believe that defense diplomacy can contribute a lot. Australia may not, uh, sorry, uh, Indonesia may not be the claimant of South China Sea, but when two Goliaths collide, Indonesia is part of ASEAN. So as Laos, which is not a uh, non claimant uh, state, but it will be involved as well. This is very important to understand. If Indonesia choose not to, then you are part of ASEAN. And this year is very significant because ASEAN uh, is championship by the Indonesia. This will be the best possible time to push the agenda forward, saying, even though you are non claimant state, but you have the stake in ASEAN. Because ASEAN should be, should be, greater than anything else. We cannot stand, um, when you talk about South China Sea, imagine the hot spot in the future. When we talk about code of conduct, it should be ripple effect from the top to the bottom. When we decided on the top level what we should do, what we shouldn't do, but it doesn't transcend to the bottom, imagine what will be the soldiers or the sailors on that particular ship and that particular skirmishes. Anything can happen. So this seriousness of code of conduct should not be taken lightly. We should ask ourselves, are we serious? If we are, come up with a solution. And it should be the ripple effect right to the bottom so people down on the street or people, the sailors on the ship, understood what is the con code of conduct. And we must also, as ASEAN state, force them to understand the UNCLOS 82. We have to respect, they have to respect UNCLOS 82. Malaysia can't stand alone. Singapore cannot stand alone. Philippines cannot stand alone. None of the 10 states, and even Timor Leste, when they become ASEAN, we cannot stand alone. We have to stand as one. As one, that is the only solution that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Datu. I think you are absolutely right by referring back to the UNCLOS. And code of conduct should not contradict the provisions contained therein. Otherwise, we are going to establish another treaty, limited in scope, uh, you know, uh, that can also be 
counterproductive to our uh, objectives as well as purposes, overlapping as well. So with these three distinguished gentlemen, I have given their responses to your questions. I think this concludes our session. And thank you very much, Honorable Governor and dear participants for attending this session. And big applause to the three speakers, please. Thank you.